Conflict in the Middle East and a fragmenting global economy. What does it all mean for global trade? Well, to discuss that, I'm joined by Ralph Osser, who's chief economist at the World Trade Organization, which has just published its latest global trade outlook. Thanks a lot for being with us, Ralph. Uh, if it's not too sort of broad a question to ask, 2024 for global trade, I mean, how's it looking? Well, first of all, thank you very much uh, for having me. Um, so what we are predicting in terms of the volume uh, of world merchandise trade, we predicted to grow by 2.6% in 2024, so this year, and then by 3.3% uh, next year, after a reduction uh, of the volume uh, of world merchandise trade by 1.2% uh, last year. So overall, I would say uh, things are moving in the right direction, and we are more or less back in a situation where trade is moving uh, or is growing one for one with uh, GDP. So no deglobalization. Uh, things are st uh, stabilizing, which is, of course, uh, good to see. 2023 was a weird one, wasn't it? And it was worse than expected in terms of global trade. Why were trade volumes so much lower than had been expected for the year? Yeah, indeed. So uh, trade in 2023 was weaker than we expected. And if you uh, just look at the numbers, it's pretty clear that it's uh, Europe uh, and the weaker than expected performance of Europe that is uh, driving these results. Now, the question is, where is this coming from? And our uh, story is that this is uh, due to inflation and also high energy prices in Europe, because, of course, um, you know, if inflation is high, if energy prices are high, then real income is uh, low and um, consumers are postponing consumption decisions. And it's a well-known fact that that particularly hits manufacturing. Think of consumer durables. Uh, also think of investment goods for firms. I haven't even talked about uh, interest rates. And that then hits trade uh, particularly. So uh, we think it's inflation that explains it mainly. 2024, 2025, by the WTO's reckoning, are going to be better years for global trade. But the report does cite the conflict in the Middle East as posing a threat to its forecast. I mean, what form does that threat take in terms of global trade? Yeah, so we are we are monit monitoring this uh, situation uh, closely at the moment. Um, our assessment is that the conflict in the Middle East and in particular uh, in the Red Sea uh, is not having dramatic effects on world trade. Of course, um, the Suez Canal handles about 12% of world trade. It handles um, about one third of container traffic between Asia and Europe. So of course, having a disruption there is problematic. Um, but in terms of the big picture, in terms of the aggregate numbers, we are not seeing a major effect yet. And that's simply because uh, supply chains are not under as much pressure as they were, for example, when the Ever Given uh, was stranded. There's more shipping capacity, there's more um, uh, less demand in Europe, there's also um, lower freight rates. So, so that's the um, current assessment in terms of the risk. Um, the one big risk that that we see is that the conflict in the Middle East uh, has impacts on energy markets, so rising oil prices, for example, uh, then it could also become a more serious problem for the global macroeconomy and also for trade. When you look at a, a graph of the passage of goods and freight through the Red Sea and through the Suez Canal, you see these two enormous dips. You've mentioned both of the, the, the causes, the uh, ever given incident in 2021 mm -hmm. and of course what's happening now and both of those dips are, are comparable it's a significant drop a, a halving of the amount of traffic that's going through there trade traffic that's going through there you sort of playing down the the impact of that but it seems like that that must be having a, a a big impact on trade particularly between asia and europe and north africa well the the thing is you're right that in in both instances we had disruptions and of course now they are they are much more uh, longer lasting, even though perhaps not quite as extreme because there's still some traffic. But the big difference is just the, the macro environment, in particular the, the trade environment, because when the ever given um, got stranded, um, supply chains were under extreme pressure. There was huge demand. Um, there was very limited shipping capacities. Uh, freight rates were already through the roof. So it was very hard for the logistics sector to kind of absorb or, or offer, provide this additional capacity. But now, I mean, yes, you need to take um, a longer route. And yes, this needs additional shipping capacity. But it seems like that the shipping capacity is available now. So I don't want to say it doesn't have any effect. Of course, there's certain sectors in, in Europe that are affected. And, and uh, so, so I don't want to downplay it completely. But but if you think about the big picture, you know, is this really going to have um, a huge effect? Uh, or is this a, a big part of the story for why we have uh, uh, the, the reduction in trade in, in 2021? Uh, I think the inflation is really the, 
more important driver. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that is cushioning, I suppose, uh, against the kind of disruption to, to global trade that, that we could have is the fact that demand is still quite low. But that is something that exactly. is going to change over 2024 and 2025. So if the problems that are preventing passage of goods through the Suez Canal don't change and they don't go away in that time. Is there a potential for it to become a, a bit more of an issue? Sure. So, so, so it could could become a, a, a more important of an issue for sure. And we are monitoring it closely, exactly as you say, just because it's not a uh, such a significant problem now doesn't mean that it's not going to be a significant problem uh, in the future. Um, but uh, at least the shipping capacity, as far as my information goes, is 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 there. So so this bottleneck seems uh, to be an unlikely one. But demand, yes, and and of course in general, um, you know these geopolitical tensions um, uh, are dangerous. And and speaking of sort of geopolitical politics, anyway, geopolitical tensions, you can call it. But the report also talks about um, the risks of protectionism and a fragmentation of global economy, you can see that, particularly since the war in Ukraine, that there's sort of one block of countries that are trading much more with each other and another one, you know, these are notional blocks that, you know, they're, they're, they're not official mm -hmm. blocks, but you can see that trade between two, uh, I suppose, politically different units of the world, are, 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 they're, they're trading with each other less and they're trading more within each other. Is that something that the WTO sees as a problem for global trade? So first of all, let me confirm and, and perhaps put this in perspective. So we do see first signs of fragmentation. Um, and this is something that, uh, you know, we see from many angles, you can look at uh, trade between China and the United States, for example, you'll see that trade between these two countries is growing 30% more slowly than trade uh, between either of these countries and the rest of the world. So it's not that US-China trade is slowing so dramatically, it's just that the trade shares are moving away from, from those two countries. Then the fact that you mentioned we divided the world into two hypothetical geopolitical blocks based on UN uh, voting behavior. And, and indeed, you see that trade within these quote unquote blocks is growing faster than trade between these two blocks. And, and we cite other examples in the report. And yes, this is something we are concerned about. We um, had a simulation exercise uh, uh, published um, a while ago, which we also recall in this report here, which says that, you know, in the worst case scenario where we really have a geoeconomic uh, fragmentation of goods trade, that could uh, cost uh, up to 5% of uh, worldwide GDP with much higher figures for some developing countries who are particularly reliant on international trade. And one thing that's new in this report here that is uh, quite interesting, I think, that I wanted to draw your attention to, um, there's also digital trade and digital trade uh, relies on data flows. And there's all sorts of discussions on, on data flow regulation. So, so one thing uh, we have also done, we have simulated um, geoeconomic fragmentation in uh, data flow uh, policies and if, if if that were to happen that alone uh, we estimate would uh, also reduce GDP by something like one percent but the governments and corporations that are that are involved in this sort of it goes under various names decoupling uh, fragmentation however you want to talk about it they they're, they're doing this to try and shore up their own supply chains and their own businesses and and cushion them uh, insulate them mm -hmm. from the the ebb and flow of politics. Isn't the shoring up of supply chains in that way, isn't that a, a good thing for trade? Well, what, what we are advocating for is not um, a reshoring or home shoring, but is something that we call a re-globalization. See, it's, it, it's, it's, I, I can totally understand that uh, some people and some governments feel that supply chains are over-concentrated and the, that you don't want to be exposed to risks from uh, individual countries. But the answer is not to make things at home. Uh, the answer is to have more diversified international trade. And, and we saw, we, we see this uh, over and over again. I mean, think about the COVID pandemic uh, as one of many examples. It's true that there were supply chain uh, disruptions at the beginning, and it is true um, that, uh, you know, there were issues getting respirators, getting masks and so on at the beginning. But then very quickly, um, we also all know that trade was part of the solution because where did these masks come from? Where did these respirators come from? Where did the uh, vaccines come from at the end of the day? Uh, was from other countries who were, for example, not in lockdown when we are we were in lockdown. So it's pretty clear that, um, 
you know, it's, it's very hard to predict where supply shortages are going to happen. And it's also very hard to predict who can step in. So what you really need is outside options. And for to, to have outside options, you really need multilateral trade. Okay, I, I mean, I've been focusing on the risks to your uh, predictions mm -hmm. so far. I don't want to be accused of being overly negative. So, so tell us something to be optimistic about for, for 2024 and 2025. Well, well, first, let me give you the big picture. And, and I think the big picture really is that uh, trade, even goods trade, is remarkably resilient. Uh, we talked about uh, all the macro pressures. You know, we had a global pandemic. We have a war in Europe. We have uh, or had record high inflation. We have restrictive uh, monetary policy, limited fiscal space. And and overall, if you look at the, uh, at the figure, trade is more or less flat in, in 2023. Yes, it fell a little bit relative to 2024, but overall, uh, I would I would say it plateaued and and it's set to pick up again this year and next year. So I think this is uh, remarkable. And then moreover, we haven't even talked about services trade. So services trade is a clear uh, bright spot. Services trade grew by nine percent uh, last year, uh, driven uh, to some extent by tourism or to an important extent by uh, a revival of tourism after the uh, COVID um, pandemic made that made that difficult or made that impossible. And also we continue to see a very rapid growth in digitally delivered services, which we believe to be the future of trade, or at least to be an important uh, part of this future. So um, I think resilience is one good news, and then services and the evolution there is another uh, good news for you. Okay, Ralph Osser, Chief Economist at the World Trade Organization. Thank you so much for fielding our questions. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks to you for watching this video by the DW Business team. There is plenty more from us here on the DW News YouTube channel, so we'll see you in the next thing.